Good afternoon, everybody. Are you having a good day? Okay, we don't have anybody in yet, but I'm going to go ahead and begin for those of you who need to watch it later. I'm going to start with chapter three and then move on to 17a. Okay, this chapter, uh, chapter three, is uh, about movement across membranes. So when we talk about membrane tissues, uh, you can have what we mean by membranous tissue is something you see with the unaided eye. So we're talking about a tissue that you peel away. And a good example of that is the pericardial membrane or pericardium. So notice in green here should be the blank that you have to fill in. Epithelial tissues, one to many cells thick. So this is a little bit smaller, but these are both examples of membranous tissues made up of many, many cells. The other example or the other meaning of membrane is the cell membrane. And another name for that is the plasma limb, and this encloses cells. So notice that here we have a cell membrane at the bottom around each cell, but you also have a macroscopic membranous tissue around the heart. Okay, this is an image, I believe, from your text showing you the different uh, molecules that you would find in cell membrane. There's phospholipid bilayer, channel proteins, allows things in and out, integral membrane protein, which stabilizes or could act as an enzyme. And then glycoprotein is a protein with a carbohydrate attached. One of the things you should know about this is when there's a carbohydrate attached, this thing here is part of the glycocalyx. And this is what the body uses or the immune system uses to determine if a cell is part of you or an invader. Okay, membrane, membrane proteins that bind with molecules. Now, what we're looking at here is a receptor, uh, often made out of protein, and the ligand binds to it. A good example of that would be a hormone binding to a receptor causing an event in the cell. So this is a ligand receptor complex, triggers an event in the cell, often a hormone. Membrane-associated enzymes may catalyze or cause to happen external reactions such as digestion in small cells. For example, there are enzymes on the surface of your cells, of your digestive tract that help you finish the digestion process of your food. Internal reactions can be in terms of transferring external signals to the cytoplasm. And that's what this figure is showing here. Receptors bind specific ligands. Notice that they have the exact same shape. If the receptor is not the same shape as the ligand, it will not bind and nothing will happen. So a good example is of a ligand is a hormone. And cell recognition molecules we will uh, be looking at later. And I showed you a figure earlier on. Transport of proteins, moving substances across membranes. So a good example of that is a channel protein. I showed you an image of that earlier in the presentation. If it's an open channel protein, it creates a water-filled passageway to the ECF, which is extracellular fluid, and it can vary in sizes. So larger uh, channel proteins allow larger molecules through, and smaller channel proteins only allow the smallest molecules through. If it's gated, it's still a channel protein, but it can be open or closed. It's usually closed, but can open to allow passage of certain molecules. For example, sodium potassium, we'll be talking about later, have gated channel proteins that allow those molecules through at particular times when, when they need to go. They're less selective, which means that anything small as smaller as small or smaller than the whole can pass usually. And uh, they're often called pores. And we have pores in our skin, but nuclear pores are found in the surface of the nuclear envelope that allows materials in and out, especially messenger RNA to get out of the nucleus to do uh, protein synthesis. Now, carrier proteins are different. They bind directly to the substrate and only open to one side of the membrane at a time. And the way to think of this is kind of like a revolving door or a turnstile. The idea is that one person goes into the turnstile, moves through, and then another person moves through. It's less of a doorway, more like a turnstile. So it's slower, but it's more specific. So the downside, it doesn't move things as quickly. But the upside is it only moves the things that are supposed to be moved and nothing else. Okay, here's that same image that I wanted to show you this glycocalyx, and it's made up of a combination of primarily glycoproteins, but also glycolipids. Notice that they're sticking out from the surface so that white blood cells involved in cell recognition can check to see whether or not this is you or an invader. So it's used in cell recognition, cell stability, and the immune response. It's composed of both glycolipids and glycoproteins, and you see them here in this image. I believe this image is from your text. Okay, body fluid compartments. 
Now, if it's inside an individual cell, it's called ICF or intracellular fluid. It doesn't say F here, but it stands for fluid. The F is for fluid. So intracellular fluid is ICF. And that is synonymous or the same thing as the cytoplasm. In extracellular fluid, it's any fluid outside of the cell. So there's two different compartments that make up extracellular fluid. It can be interstitial. And this is the fluid you find between cells, but not inside of blood. So there is fluid um, between the cells. And this fluid ends up in your lymphatic uh, capillaries and lymphatic ducts and your lymph nodes. And it becomes what is called lymph or lymphatic fluid. Plasma is the liquid portion of blood. This is also part of extracellular fluid. Okay, now, uh, one of the essays I'm gonna be asking you about is this thing called Fick's Law of Diffusion. So you really wanna take detailed notes here on how it works. Now, what we're gonna be talking about is how you want, the body wants to maximize diffusion by affecting this equation. Now, I know when you hear something that looks like math, your eyes roll to the back of your head and you stop listening, but, I'm gonna explain this in detail after I do the notes, and I'm gonna to explain to you what you need to say in your essay when I ask you, tell me as much as you can about Fick's law. Okay, first of all, we're gonna talk about diffusion. Diffusion stops at equilibrium. What that means is when there's equal amounts of material on both sides of a membrane, it's not going to continue to change. It will stay the same when it's equal. Now particles can be moving across the membrane, but equal amounts in and out at equilibrium, which means even amounts on both sides. Now, what are some factors that, that affect how fast things diffuse across the membrane? Well, we can talk about surface area. That's down here in the purple. Temperature, which is not part of this equation. Distance, which is here in thickness of membrane. Please note, distance and thickness of membrane are the same thing. It's the distance through which materials have to move across the membrane. Lipid solubility is over here in this part of membrane resistance. And size of molecule diffusing is also part of uh, membrane resistance. Okay, so this is not in your text, so you need to listen to what I have to say. Take detailed notes. Now, the nice thing is you guys are watching this on a recording. You push pause, take notes. Please do not go out on the internet and try to figure out how to discuss fixed law of diffusion by grabbing something that you see there because that will be worth nothing. Listen and take detailed notes. Okay, what we're talking about with Fick's law is a fraction. Now, if you remember, there's numerator on top and denominator on the bottom. So what is going to happen with the body is it wants to make everything on the bottom small and everything on the top large. For example, if you look at a fraction like one third and then compare it to one fourth, the number on the bottom, one fourth, is bigger than the number one third. The question you have to ask yourself is, what is the larger overall amount? What is more water, a third of a cup or a quarter of a cup? And if you know anything about measurements, you know that a third of a cup is more than a fourth of a cup because the larger the number on the bottom, the smaller the overall value. So for example, half is more than a fifth because the big number on bottom means you have to cut it that many more times. So what the body's trying to do is make the stuff in pink here as small as possible and the stuff on top as large as possible. For example, one third or two thirds, which has which is more? Well, you know that two thirds is twice as much as one third. So having the larger numbers on the top means that you're going to have more overall amount. And in this case, we're trying to get the rate of diffusion, how fast things diffuse. And a perfect example of that is oxygen getting from air of your lungs into the blood. You want that to happen quickly. You also want food to diffuse quickly from your digestive tract, the lumen, where the food is, into your blood so you can transport it through your body. So let's talk about these various things I'm gonna talk about, you guys listen. Okay, so let's talk about the stuff on top first in purple. Available surface area. Now, if you've ever heard the expression, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, that means you can have a very small amount of surface if it's flat. Flat is low surface. But instead of making it flat, what if we make it curved like a wavy line? Since that is not a straight line, it is a much longer line and a much greater surface area. So what the body does in places like the lungs, the digestive tract, 
anywhere where you want a lot of diffusion happening quickly. Instead of making it flat, it makes it curvy. So if you look on the inside of the lungs, you see the alveoli are curved like the inside of a grape cluster. And the surface of your small intestine has these finger-like projections. And each of those finger-like projections has little projections sticking off of that, which vastly increases the surface area. So when I ask, what does the body do to maximize diffusion anatomically and physiologically? One of the things it does anatomically is might make sure that where diffusion has to be quick, there's a large surface area. It does that by making it folded. Lots of folds and curved surfaces increase the surface area. That increases the rate of diffusion. And in that way, you get more food into your blood and more oxygen into your blood. Okay, that's surface area or A. Okay, the next thing that we're gonna increase here is concentration gradient. This is a physiological mo modification that your body does. Now, what do we mean by concentration gradient? Well, the difference between inside and outside is the gradient. So in a, let's say you're going down the grade, the grade is a hill, and there's a big difference between the top of the hill and the bottom. So the gradient means, what is the difference in concentration between the inside and the outside? And the greater the difference, the faster diffusion happens because more stuff is gonna go that way and comes back the other way because there's a whole bunch more over here than over there. And so it goes that way faster. And as soon as it gets closer to equilibrium, then as one particle goes this way, another one's gonna go the other way. So noticeable diffusion slows down. So what does the body do physiologically to increase concentration gradient? Well, let's go back to the lungs. Well, you're not gonna let the blood get to equilibrium because when it does, you're not gonna be picking up any more oxygen. So what the body does physiologically is as soon as it picks up enough oxygen in the lungs, it moves it out and brings in more deoxygenated blood so that there's always less oxygen in the blood than is in the lungs. Because as soon as it got saturated with blood, you move it out of the way and bring in more that is unsaturated. So that what that means is there's always gonna be a gradient from the air of your lungs into your blood because you move the oxygenated blood out, bring in more deoxygenated blood. That's a physiological adaptation to increasing the rate of diffusion by making sure that the concentration gradient stays as high as possible. Okay, that's the numerator. We want this to be large. Curved surface, concentration gradient by moving the oxygenated uh, blood out of the way. Now, let's go to the bottom. Membrane resistance. Now, this is a little bit weird, but membrane resistance is shown by these two things. Now, what I'm going to ask you guys to do, I know this is a little bit confusing, but what I want you to do is put lipid solubility up in the numerator and molecular size in the denominator. So lipid solubility goes up here with the purple and molecular size goes down with the pink. So we're going to add lipid solubility here and we're going to take out membrane resistance and put a molecular size on the bottom. Okay. So let's talk about these, lipid solubility. That means the ability for it to go through lipid. Now, why is that important? Well, notice the center of the membrane is all oily or lipids. If something can diffuse right through lipids, it can get right through this oily core and make its way through. So if it has lipid solubility, that increases its rate of diffusion. So lipid solubility goes up on top. Molecular size is the opposite. Bigger things move more slowly than smaller things. How long does it take a cat to get through a door versus an elephant? It takes the elephant a lot longer because it's a big object that needs to start moving slowly and eventually goes. The cat can go through very quickly because it's a small, much smaller object. So when we're talking about molecules, large molecules are going to diffuse slowly. So the bigger the molecule, the less quickly it diffuses. Now, the body can't do anything about this because you have to diffuse what you have to diffuse, but the molecules primarily that are going to be diffusing are in the lungs are going to be oxygen and CO2, fairly small molecules. But in the digestive tract, you can either move proteins, which are really big, or amino acids, which are much smaller. So what the body does is it breaks it into amino acids, making it a smaller molecule and therefore allowing it to come in more quickly. That's a physiological response. Break the large molecules and the smaller ones, and you can get them through quickly into the blood and use it as nutrition. Okay, so lipid solubility goes on top, 
molecular size goes on the bottom. Now on the test, I'm gonna actually ask you to write this out. And if you don't, you won't get it. So how do you write this out? Well, you can on one line of your answer, you're gonna write these words, available surface area, concentration, gradient, lipid solubility, all on one line with a little X for times. Then you're gonna go to the next line, put a dotted line or an underline. Then the third line, you put molecular size in place of membrane resistance and thickness of the membrane. And that way, I know that you know what the equation says. So the last thing that we're gonna do is think, look at thickness of membrane. Now, if you wanna get people from one side of a structure to the inside of the structure, do you have them go through a long hallway or do you have them go through a fairly thin door? The answer is go through the thin door. Now you're from outside to inside quickly. So by having this membrane be thin, it gives less time that it takes to get through it. So what we're gonna see in the lungs, again, and in the digestive tract is very, very thin membranes. So the distance from the outside to the inside is minimized. So when we say thickness of membrane, if you want diffusion to happen quickly, if you want plenty of oxygen, you want plenty of food, you make this very thin. That's why when you look at the inside of the lungs, the, the, uh, the surface of the inside of the lungs, um, you're gonna see a very, very thin membrane in the same with the digestive tract. That's another anatomical adaptation is by making this membrane very, very thin. That increases how fast things go. Now notice it says temperature. Pretty much we keep temperature stable, but in a test tube, if you want things to diffuse more quickly, you make it warmer. And that's part of the reason why we're warm inside is to increase the speed of all these chemical reactions, okay? Now, you guys aren't here to ask me questions because nobody came today, that's okay. But uh, if you watch this tonight and you have questions, if you do come to lab tomorrow, be sure to ask me questions about fixed law and I will answer them for you. But I can't, you guys didn't come for this. All right, so we're moving on from fixed law. Hopefully you guys can get plenty in there. Yes, you can look on the internet. Do not copy anything you find on the website or uh, in your text. I don't even think this is in your text but take good notes, you should be good to go. All right, facilitated diffusion. What does facilitated diffusion mean? It means that even though there's a concentration gradient between outside and inside, notice there's a lot more stuff out here than here, you still need a molecule to help get it from the outside to the inside. It can't just go on its own. It's facilitated by the presence of a protein. So it uses transport proteins, and that's what this figure is showing facilitated diffusion. It's passive. What does that mean is it doesn't require energy from the body to do this. It's using just the concentration gradient where there's more on one side than the other and that drives the process. I may ask you to describe this figure for the exam. All right, primary active transport. Now notice the word here is active. This is gonna require energy from you to do this. It uses ATP, which we talked about last time, adenosine triphosphate, to move products. And often it's going to move it in the direction it doesn't want to go as a result of uh, diffusion. So it's going to go up the opposite. So it goes against the concentration, concentration gradient from low to high, which is the opposite of the way that it wants to go. So you're basically forcing it to go uphill instead of downhill, which is the way it wants to go. This is how nerve cells become ready to transfer information, how they can do the action potential, how your nerves become ready to have sodium potassium flow as part of the action potential. They move sodium potassium against their gradient using energy. So that's part of the reason why just thinking takes energy is because as you use your nerve cells, you're pumping sodium potassium and it costs energy. Okay, this shows you how sodium potassium are moved. Now, I'm gonna ask you on the test potentially to tell me about this figure. So we're gonna start here and I'm gonna give you details. So take detailed notes. Now notice there's very little sodium here. These are little hexagons, these little stop sign shaped things. Are they octagons? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six hexagons. Okay, so these, what's gonna happen is sodium comes in and it binds to the inside of this transport protein. Notice that there's room for three. What happens next is we go to this next spot over here. What happens is when ATP 
binds to it. It causes the transport protein, instead of being faced inward, now it's faced outward. See, this says extracellular space. When ATP is used up, it ejects the sodium from inside to outside. So now we have even more going to where there is already plenty. Now, that's the energizing step of it that pushes the sodium out. The next step is that potassium, which is shown as ovals, binds to the inside of the membrane. Notice the inside has, this side has these curved shapes. These receptors are curved shaped that allows the potassium to stick. Now, as soon as the ADP leaves, that causes it to go from open to the outside to open to the inside again. And notice now that there's no longer these little divots there. And that pushes the sodium, or excuse me, the potassium to the inside where there's already plenty. And it causes the phosphate to be released and it repeats. So it goes from sodium binding to ATP attaching which causes the conformational change, switching from outside to inside. Sodium is popped out. The next step is potassium comes in. When the ADP leaves, leaving the phosphate there, that causes the potassium, which was bound there. Conformational change happens again. Now it's open to the inside again. And the potassium is pushed out. Notice that now there's lots of potassium in here. And the phosphate comes out. This ADP and phosphate eventually is going to make its way back to the mitochondria to be made into ATP again. So this is the cycle. Read about it in your text. I've gone through it in a little bit of detail. I may ask you to tell me how this works. Okay, phagocytosis and endocytosis. Phagocytosis means cell eating. Pinocytosis means moving small particles across a membrane. So phagocytosis is cell eating and cells engulf large particles or whole cells forming a vacuum. Now this happens with white blood cells, this happens with amoeba and other um, individual cells that are gonna be swallowing very large objects like another cell. So what happens next? Well, the lysosomes fuse with the food vacuole, which becomes what is called a phagosome. That dumps the digestive enzymes that were in the lysosome into the vacuole, forming a phagosome, that digests it, breaks up that cell or organelle or whatever, and then the nutrients are absorbed into the cell. Now, this is how amoeba get nutrition, but this is how your white blood cells destroy bacterial cells or viruses that they happen to come across. In endocytosis, it's different. In, instead of bringing a whole cell in, you're trying to take a small molecule by forming a vesicle around it. And this shows you how it works. Now, notice, that the star fits in with this little green receptor. And what happens is invaginations or infolding happens. And what was once on the outside is now on the inside of this little bubble and is transported somewhere to be used. And this is how you can get a molecule, like this star-shaped molecule, inside so your body can use it. In this case, you don't need a receptor. You're just going to have molecules coming in, the vesicle forms. More, most likely, though, you have the molecule, uh, the, the uh, ligand stick to the receptor, invagination using a molecule called, called clathrin, and now you have the material that you want inside. That's endocytosis, moving something inside of the cell. It can be receptor mediated. Notice this one is receptor mediated, but this one is not. Exocytosis uses the opposite steps. There would be something in here, it would fuse with the surface and then be dumped to the outside. So basically, imagine bringing it in and then dumping it to the outside. That's exocytosis, okay? I hit the wrong thing because it jumped. Okay. So that is, uh, that was chapter three. Now we're gonna jump to chapter 17. Hope you have your notes ready. Okay, chapter 17, part one, or part A. Endocrine, the study of hormones and their functions is called endocrinology. Hormones work on their target cells in three basic ways. Now, the target cell means any cell that is going to have a receptor on the surface and would be affected by a hormone. So it can control the rates of enzymatic reactions. So that can speed up or slow down how quickly you build molecules or break them down or change them. 
It can control transport across membranes, how quickly material is transported across a membrane. Most commonly, though, it controls gene expression and protein synthesis. So, for example, a hormone sticks to the surface of a cell, it can cause a chain reaction to happen, or more often, that hormone would go all the way inside of a cell, affect your DNA, and cause it to make a piece of messenger RNA, which would eventually result in protein being synthesized, okay? Chemical regulating systems. So now pheromones are different than hormones because they go outside of the individual. Now it's well-documented in animals. When a, a female dog or cat goes into heat, she gives off pheromones as part of her body odors and male dogs come, come running towards her if they can. Um, moths do this. They can communicate across miles by releasing pheromones into the air. Now, the question is, do humans have or use pheromones? Well, we don't know for sure. And one of the review questions says, what's the problem talking about pheromones in humans? And the problem is we don't know for sure whether or not we have them. And if we did, what exactly, what hormones they are. So be aware of that. That is a review question, potentially a test question. Would pheromones be endocrine or exocrine? Well, endocrine means secreted into the blood or other bodily fluid that is for certain to be retained. Exocrine means put into a fluid that's going onto the body surface out of you. So it has to be exocrine because that's the only way it can get to the outside of the body is to go, let's say, in sweat. Some people believe that there are pheromones in sweat. Now, there is some apocryphal or story-based uh, evidence of pheromones. And one of those is menstrual synchrony. Now, what is menstrual synchrony? Well, you got ladies especially know what menstruation is, the period. What happens is often when women live together for large, long periods of time, they go into what is called menstrual synchrony. That is, they start having their periods at the same time. Even though before they started living together, one woman would have at the beginning of the month, one in the middle and one at the end. And if they stayed long enough together, they end up having their menstrual cycles at the same time. So that's some evidence that they're giving off something that's affecting the other women and getting them into some form of synchrony. Now, what is the benefit of that? We're not certain. Maybe so that everybody can be on their period at the same time and maybe be conceiving at the same time, giving birth at the same time, not certain. But there's something that's happening that's causing these women to go into synchrony and it could be pheromones, but scientists aren't sure. Hormones, though, very well established. In this case, it's cell to cell communication within the body, produced in one part of the body, flows through the blood, goes to another part of the body, causes something to happen in that part of the body. They're made in endocrine glands or individual endocrine cells. They're always transported by the blood throughout the body, and they stick to distant target tissue receptors. So the receptor has to have the same shape as the hormone. When the hormone sticks, it causes something to happen in any cell that has that receptor. This activates a physiological response. That is, something changes inside the cell, and one of those three things that I showed you earlier. Why is the hormone activated only just before entering the bloodstream? Why not produce it in its active form? Well, you don't want the hormone affecting the cell that made it. You don't want it to start producing something because the cell that made it is not the target cell. The target cell is the one that is intended for the hormone. So what the body does is it produces it in an inactive form and just before it gets released, it activates it. A good analogy to this is bombs are made in factories. We don't wanna arm the bomb in the factory because it could go off. So what do they do? They don't arm the bomb until after it's on the plane or even sometimes after it's dropped away from the plane, it gets activated. So you do not want to activate these potentially dangerous molecules inside the cell that produced it. You want to make sure it's active only in the blood. So that when it sticks to a cell, that causes it to cause the chemical reaction, not inside the cell that made it. Okay. Now, this is, these are hormone receptors. This is called the second messenger system. I'm not going to be asking you details about that, but there it is. This is not from your text. So peptide or protein-based hormones cannot enter target cells. So please notice if I said what hormone cannot enter target cells could have two right answers. Protein-based or peptide hormones are both the correct answer, so beware of that on the test. Surface receptors bind the hormone and cause a cascade reaction inside the target cell. So notice that they bind to the surface and a whole bunch of chemical reactions are happening in here and there's going to be a cellular response. Something's going to change. 
figure to the right is example. It's not in your textbook, but it shows you how that works. So if a hormone binds, it can cause an ion channel to open. It can cause what is called a second messenger system, which affects proteins and eventually a, a cellular response. This is very generic, just showing you possible outcomes if the hormone does not enter the cell. Okay, amine hormones are different. There are a, a class of protein hormones, but they're not normally considered protein hormones. They're very small. They're either made of one to two amino acids. They always contain a benzene. Now, if you're getting your bachelor's degree in nursing, you will take organic chemistry and you'll learn all about benzene. It's an alternating double bonded six carbon molecule, which you'll learn about in organic chemistry. So what are some amine hormones? Well, thyroxine is part of metabolism, one of your thyroid hormones. Epinephrine, you guys have heard of adrenaline, same thing, it's the fight or flight. And melatonin, which you may take as a supplement, which is involved in sleep-wake cycles. We're going to be talking later why taking melatonin for sleep is not a good idea and why that is the case. All right, steroid hormones. These are the most famous and most well-known hormones. So they're steroid hormones that are derived from cholesterol. So cholesterol is the base molecule, which is modified into these steroid hormones. They're produced in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Why? Because the smooth endoplasmic reticulum is always involved in lipid-based materials. Cholesterol is lipid-based. So steroid hormones are always lipid-based. And that's one of the ways that's a benefit for them because they can move across the membrane, make their way quickly into target cells. But they have to be transported by a hydrophilic protein. Question is why? Well, what does hydrophilic mean? Something that mixes with water. Well, as you guys know, oil, lipids, does not mix well with water. So if you're going to go through a liquid medium like lymph or like blood, you can't be oil, all oily. Oily materials do not go well through blood. So what you do is you attach them to a protein that does mix with water. That's what hydrophilic means. Hydro, water, philic, loving, or it allows it to mix. So hydrophilic protein is a protein that can mix with it, and it can also attach to the cholesterol. That's the benefit of the protein. So it's kind of like a carrier that allows this oily material, these steroid hormones derived from cholesterol, to go through your blood and make it to their target cell. Now, these hormones themselves are what are called lipophilic, which means oil-loving. And that means they can easily go through the plasma membrane. So remember if we said lipid solubility increases diffusion? So these hormones are going to be able to easily go right through that oily double membrane, double uh, phospholipid membrane, and get into the cell. So they enter the target cell, then move to a cytoplasmic or nuclear receptor. And what we mean is there's another protein in there because the inside of your cell is also water. So if you want to get from the inside of the membrane all the way over to the nucleus, you've got to get a nuclear or cytoplasmic receptor, like another protein is going to carry it from the cell membrane over to the nucleus. Now, often these have, have what is called a genomic effect. And a genomic effect means anything that has an effect on the DNA. So many of these hormones have a genomic effect. And that is they actually turn on the DNA for protein synthesis. Now, for example, you guys have heard of anabolic steroids, right? Anabolic steroids help you build muscle. How do they do that? Well, they go to your muscle cells, they penetrate through the cell membrane, they go to the nucleus and they tell the nucleus, hey, make a lot more actin and myosin protein and turn it into muscle. So these anabolic steroid hormones cause your muscle to be built, especially if you exercise, because it's telling your DNA, hey, make a lot more protein because we need to get stronger. So cortisol is a stress hormone, which is a steroid hormone. Estrogen, female hormone, and testosterone, which as we know, helps build. Um, build muscle, especially in men. Okay, so I'm going to show you this figure. It may or may not be on the next test. Now, if I ask you this, then it is. I'm going to ask you to be able to describe the process. So we have a lipid-soluble hormone. What you don't see in this figure is how it is attached to a carrier molecule. So I want you guys to imagine, you need to have this in your essay, if this figure is on the test is that there's a carrier, a lipo, uh, hydrophilic carrier protein, which is gonna carry this through. It's gonna drop it off and it's gonna go through and go right through the membrane. Now remember, because it is 
oily, you can go right through. It doesn't need to go through any through any kind of tunnel channel. Now, there's that receptor that I talked about. But remember, this blue thing is also going to be in the blood. So don't forget that. They just forgot to put that in. So this receptor hormone complex is going to go through the cell, through the nuclear pore, and attach directly to the DNA. When it does that, it causes the DNA to unzip and for a piece of messenger RNA to be copied. So if you open up the DNA and then run an enzyme through there, it'll copy that section of the DNA into a piece of messenger RNA. Notice that the messenger RNA is only single-sided, DNA is double-sided. Now the hormone is done and it gets destroyed, but now the messenger RNA makes its way out of the nucleus and to these structures that are called ribosomes. And it doesn't say anything about ribosomes there, but each of these kind of orangey brown things is a ribosome. And as the messenger RNA flows through it, protein is produced and this protein then can be used in the cell, either to build muscle or as an enzyme or whatever. But this protein was produced because this hormone came from an endocrine gland, made its way into the cell, caused the DNA to unzip, messenger RNA to be made, that caused these proteins to be made. Eventually, protein has to be folded up and edited out so it's just right. Now this protein can either be part of your cell or do something else. It could be potentially another hormone that would leave. Okay, so if this figure is on the test, you will need to be able to tell me about it. Okay, endocrine reflex path. Now we're going to be talking about reflex pathways here. And I don't know if you guys know what a reflex is. For example, if you hit somebody right below the patella when they're relaxed with something like a rubber mallet, their knee swings out. It's automatic. So endocrine reflexes, hormone reflexes work the same way. The stimulus. In this case, there's an input or signal to begin the reflex. A variety of different stimulus can start this. So the signal goes from where you sense it towards the central nervous system. The central nervous system, either the brain or the spinal cord, in this case, they're, they're saying it's the brain, makes the decision consciously or subconsciously. Well, if it's a reflex, it's always subconscious. So you don't get to decide whether or not a reflex happens. You don't decide whether your knee swings out. It happens automatically, so it's always subconscious. Now, the signal is going to go out. In this case, when we talk about endocrine reflexes, the hormone gets released often by the hypothalamus, which is part of the brain. Now, this, ref this hormone can either go to another gland, for example, your pituitary, or it can go directly to a body tissue to cause a physiological action. Often it's negative feedback. What this means is homeostasis is everything's nice and steady. Well, you got out of homeostasis. So what happens is the signal makes it to the brain. And your brain says, we need to get back to normal. So a physiological action happens, which is supposed to get us back to normal. And negative feedback says, hey, we're back to normal. So it's going to feed back a negative signal saying, we don't need to do this response anymore because we are back to normal. So negative feedback means goes from the end, which is the effect, back to the central nervous system and say, you don't need to release this hormone anymore because we've gotten ourselves back to normal. Negative feedback, turn off the signal, which was trying to get us back to normal. So the reflex subsides. So this is the basic series of steps in an endocrine reflex pathway. Okay, this figure is not in your book, but I may be asking you about it. So I'm going to go through this in detail. Take notes. It could be an essay. So there's a lot of essays in this particular set of notes. Okay, now the reason why this is such an important figure, by the way, is if you are going to be involved in healthcare management on some level, like a nurse, a lot of your patients are going to have diabetes. And this figure shows why so many people in our country <clears throat> get diabetes. Now, diabetes negatively affects lots of body parts, and people end up in the hospital or in clinics because they're body is kind of falling apart as a result of the effects of the diabetes. Okay, so let's talk about this. Now, when you do this essay, if it is on the test, I'm going to ask you to talk about both pathways. And what I want you to notice is there's one pathway that bypasses all this straight down. It goes from eat a meal to blood glucose to pancreas to insulin, etc. So this is one pathway. We're going to be talking about that first. The second pathway is go straight down and make its way to the end. Okay, so let's talk about it. When you eat a meal, one of the things that could be in that food is sugar, and it often is, even in the form of starch. 
So it may not taste sweet. Even if you eat a potato, there's a lot of sugar in it. So when you eat that, it causes blood glucose to go up. Don't worry about this dotted line and equal sign here for now. When you eat a meal, often your blood glucose level rises. Now, when your blood glucose level rises as a result of, of absorbing sugar from your food, the pancreas senses this. So we're going to bypass all the rest of this. The pancreas senses the increase in blood glucose. And the result is the secretion of insulin. And that goes directly into your blood. Okay, so the insulin now enters your blood and it goes to target tissues. Now, what is the point of insulin? The point of insulin is it allows glucose to go from your blood where there's high amounts into your cells, especially places like your muscle and liver where it's gonna be stored. So if you wanna move glucose, which is the main food molecule from the blood into the cells, you have to have insulin and insulin does this. Now, we're gonna be talking about um, desensitization and uh, down regulation, things like that in a bit. But the idea is if you put too much insulin in, it function, functions kind of like the boy who cried wolf. If you guys remember that story, he kept crying wolf over and over because he thought it was funny watching people freak out. And eventually when a real wolf came around, he said, there's a wolf. They didn't believe him. He got eaten up. So what happens is if you put too much insulin in, your target tissues are going to start removing receptors from it, and it's not going to respond anymore. That's type 2 diabetes. Now, type 1 diabetes, you get the pancreas gets the signal, but it just can't produce enough insulin. We'll talk more about that later. Let's continue talking about this reflex. Insulin is released. It goes to the target tissue. That allows glucose uptake. That is glucose from the blood into the cells, and your body uses it or stores it. Now, as you're removing glucose from the blood, that causes blood glucose to drop back down towards normal. Now, when would this happen? Right after you ate a meal. So as soon as your blood glucose starts dropping, that sends negative feedback, stopping this stimulus, because remember the stimulus was high blood glucose. And that tells the pancreas, hey, we're good. You don't need to make any more insulin. Stop making insulin. So as soon as your body absorbs the glucose into the cells, the signal is shut off, the pancreas stops making. But what if you have a huge amount of sugar and the stimulus keeps happening and happening, happening? We're going to have a lot of insulin. What happens is it's like the boy that cried wolf and your cells stop having receptors on it because there's so much all the time, it overwhelms the system. So you start removing the receptors on the target tissues. It's called down regulation. Okay. Now, the next path. Now we went around the side, so directly from eat a meal to high blue blood glucose, but there's another pathway. What if there's not a lot of glucose in it? What if you just eat something with a lot of meat in it? Well, it's still gonna stimulate this pathway because any food in the stomach is going to stimulate it because the body assumes there's gonna be some sugar in it. So when you fill up on any, any, any food, any meal, you get an afferent neuron, which is a sensory neuron. It sends a signal to your central nervous system, your brain or spinal cord. The central nervous system sends a signal through the efferent or motor neuron to your pancreas and says, hey, we have a full stomach. You need to start making insulin in case there's sugar in the food. So now the pancreas starts making insulin and the same thing happens. You start pulling sugar out. So what it's doing is saying, we're anticipating that this big meal is gonna have sugar in it, glucose. So we're gonna start removing glucose from the blood in advance so that when the more, when the glucose comes in, we'll be ready to go. We'll be ready to start moving it out and into the cells. So what if you have a very big meal that also has sugar in it? Well, you're gonna be stimulating both pathways. You're gonna be producing even more insulin. Well, think about a supersized fast food meal. It's very large, stretch out your receptors in your digestive tract. And it often has sugary soda, right? So you're also going to blood glucose or sucrose is going to rise. In this case, you're going to break the sucrose down into glucose and fructose, but the blood glucose level shoots up really fast. So when you eat a meal like that, you're stressing your body in two ways. You're stimulating your pancreas with, looks like we finally got somebody. 
of at the last minute, but that's okay. Are you there, Say? Can you hear me okay? Didn't get say. Okay. So the idea is when you eat a meal like that, that has lots of sugar and lots of volume, you're going to be stimulating both ways. Lots of insulin produced. The boy is crying wolf at this point. The target tissues are going to remove the receptors. That's called down regulation as a result of hyperinsulinemia. And now your tissues don't respond to it very well. That's type 2 diabetes. Okay. So we'll be talking more about this in our next chapter section, which is 17B, which we'll be talking about next week. So be able to say about, plenty about this um, based on what I just said. And I can also re-explain it if you'd like tomorrow in lab. Okay. So there's nobody here. So there's no one to ask questions. So I can't be here for questions. But if you do watch this and some questions come up, write them down. And then tomorrow when you come to lab, um, ask them. And I will answer them based on uh, what, what questions you have coming up. So use this to not only fill in your essays, but also to help you answer review questions, work on those review questions. Remember, you don't turn that in. That is your study guide for the exam, those review questions. And uh, next week, which is week three, we'll be going over these in class, making sure that you have all of the review questions answered co correctly. But your homework after this is not only complete the other things, the Labster Lab and the discussion board, but also your review questions for these chapters. And they're at the end of these of the lecture notes. So I hope you guys enjoyed the lecture. Um, sorry, none of you were able to make it, but um, I'll see you tomorrow in lab, I hope. If you can't come to lab, uh, you guys are gonna need to drop the class because you do have to come to lab. It's the only way to get those lab assignments. So it is a lab, uh, on-campus lab class. So be sure to make it tomorrow to lab. Anyway, have a good afternoon. And I hope to see you tomorrow in lab. Bye, guys.